So I'm really excited to introduce um, two artists, Lisa Rybovich Prale. <laughs> I, I've known Lisa for a while, but I was like, mm, just bear with me and help me pronounce your name. <laughs> and Sarah Cahill. And I'm really excited today because it's our National Relaxation Day event out in the lobby and the forum. And hopefully you all have had a chance to meditate or take a dance class or get a chair massage. Um, and this is a new event for us, but really um, fits with YBCA's mission in, in thinking about how art and health come together and how artists use health and um, use their practice to, to help health and to help us all lead healthier lives. So this is uh, part of YBCA's programming. And then um, both of these artists who are really amazing, both um, think about health and wellness in their practice. So Lisa is an interdisciplinary artist based here in the Bay Area and her research focuses on corporeality and embodied experience in relation to sculpture, installation, and performance. And these are all forms that use the audience as, um, or the viewers to participate. And she's also the co-founder of Heavy, Heavy Breathing, a series of experimental artist-led seminars um, that combine physical activity with group discussion and think about questions like what happens when we're exercising while moving or we hold our breath and how does that change the conversation? And we also have Sarah here, who I was just telling her, I was listening to some of her music earlier today. She's a pianist, a producer, and a writer, and she has commissioned, oops, sorry, premiered and recorded numerous compositions for solo piano. She has a radio show called Revolutions Per Minute, which I really, really love that title, um, which can be heard every Sunday evening at 8 p.m. on KALW, and her um, most recent project is The Future is Female original installation and communal feminist immersive listening experience featuring more than 40 compositions from women around the globe from the 15th century to today, including um, new commissions. And I love that it goes back to the 15th century. Um, and with that, I will leave it to you two. It's so wonderful to be here. And um, thank you so much to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts for getting us together because it's, it's just a great idea. But Lisa, how do you relax in your artistic practice and are they related or are they completely separate? I think a lot of people have this idea that um, that a creative practice should be relaxing or is inherently relaxing except I don't think that most of the artists I know really feel that way and I don't necessarily feel that way. Um, I think that there's a lot of a lot of work that goes into um, maintaining a creative practice, and um, and how we define relaxation becomes an interesting thing. Um, a quick thing that came to mind when we were talking about this is um, there's a sculptor named Carol Beauvais who wrote an essay about it's called the Four Hour Art Week, and it's all about labor and leisure in relation to um, creative practice and. Um, the language that we use about working in the studio or producing a new series of work and um, how we think about that and how that might contribute to the pressure that I think a lot of artists feel about, um, about you know, constantly producing and constantly working and constantly being on. It's, it's hard sometimes. <laughs> it's hard to relax. And I, uh, um, so I think for me, Practicing the piano is, I get in that altered state and that zone, and it's, it's really great. And I think I don't necessarily like sitting in a chair listening to music I, I, when I practice, of course, but um, there was a concert series in San Francisco in the 1970s um, at an art gallery called Sight, S-I-T-E, and everyone lay on pillows. And I think that's a wonderful way, that sort of relaxed state of listening to music when you can be really tuned in, but your body is relaxed. And I want to, I want to do that. I want to do a, a music series of just lying down and listening to music instead of being forced to be like this all the time. One of the things that I was really excited to learn about Sarah is that you organized uh, Garden of Memory at Chapel of the Chimes, and um, that, for those of you who don't know, it happens twice a year on the Equinox? Uh, once, once a year. Oh, once yeah. a year. Okay. And it just happened last month? Was uh, it? June 21st. June 21st. June 21st. Sorry, yeah. And I was there, and it was amazing, <laughs> and I didn't know that you were the founder, are the founder yeah. of it. Yeah. 
And I wonder if you could describe that and kind of tell us a little bit. Yeah, so it's at the Chapel of the Chimes, which is in Oakland, a Julia Morgan designed um, columbarium where people's ashes are stored. And they're all in the shape of leather bound books, but they're brass urns. And so it's like a gigantic library. And um, we put a lot of different musicians, like 40, mostly local, experimental, avant-garde, you know, sound artists, a whole variety of mu music in the building. And then you walk through and you encounter them along the way in gardens and little alcoves and chapels. And um, it's, it's very magical. And I think part of the reason, part of how we get 4,000 people to come is that is the building itself and the kind of um, wondrous nature of, of the intersection of you know really interesting music and some interactive where Maggie Payne has a theremin and little kids come up and play it and and um, and the space and hearing music in a really unusual space and I love that and I mean here at YBCA um, I think it's it's you know, to have this sort of urban oasis where um, the people lying on the grass and it's like an impressionist painting and then you come in and the, the space is used in such a creative and interesting way always. And I think that's really the, the catch to get away from the, you know, sitting in chairs, here's the stage, sort of the, the, the traditional way of hearing music, which, which works, but I think exploring other ways is so interesting. And I, I wonder, you do a lot of site-specific work with your sculptures, and how much does space matter to you? In, I mean, are you always working with a particular space in mind? Um, that's a great question. So I work in an art studio, and I'm always really aware of the relationship between myself and you know my dimensions, my height, how long my wingspan is, that kind of stuff. Um, in relation to the objects that I'm making, and also things like, um, you know, is the sculpture I'm building uh, flexible enough that it could bend, or um, is it he heavy, does it need wheels? Like, you know, just the properties that um, are inherent to three-dimensional physical objects. Um, and a lot of the work I do is site specific, like you said, um, so that is responding to the architecture of a site, um, whether that's a gallery or an outdoor space or um, you know, wherever it's going to live, either permanently or temporarily. Um, and the other thing that your question made me think of, so part of my practice is um, organizing a project called Heavy Breathing. Heavy Breathing invites artists to give talks based on ideas and questions from their practice, but the caveat is that it has to involve movement in some way. So um, rather than all of us being relatively stationary in a space like this, uh, we're asking artists to contribute their ideas and their questions, and simultaneously we're all stretching or walking, or in one case we are swimming in a pool at YMCA. Um, and so I think that there is something really interesting about thinking in terms of how do we receive information, how are we processing things, what happens to you know, our relationship to the material, what, what happens with our um, memory retention, things like that when we're physically moving our bodies and our minds. One thing we were talking about when we had coffee on Monday was um, political activism and um, how being an artist fits in. I want to ask you about um, activism in your work and how you reach audiences who might not otherwise um, go. I, there was a wonderful video on, on, of you uh, doing some, some rings and you got people from the community to come and paint each ring and they were obviously really enjoying it. Hmm. Um, well, what comes up for me hearing the question is um, that I'm an educator too. I teach at Berkeley City College and um, it's hard for me to divorce what I'm doing in my creative practice from the kinds of conversations and activities that we do in my classes. And um, so the project you mentioned about people painting is this um, public art project that happened at the Menetti Shrum Museum. 
at UC Davis, and um, it, it was a way for me to involve 500 people in this huge sculpture um, that wrapped around the museum. And it was a way for me to make the work accessible. And I think that that's something that I try to do through teaching too is, um, you know, I think there are a lot of people who feel intimidated by art or feel like you know, they walk into a contemporary art museum and it seems alienating or um, you know, uh, not something that they can enter into easily. So I think, I um, really try to prioritize ways of making things, you know, making an entry for people. And um, the question about political activism, you know, I think that as an artist and as an educator, I, um, I really make an effort to try to support voices that have been historically marginalized, um, meaning that a lot of the artists that I show in my classes and a lot of the artists that I look at for my own work um, are made by women and people of color and people from countries that don't always make it on the map of you know, the, the art world with a capital A. At the same time, I think there's also something about um, carving out space in your life to devote to supporting a creative practice that that in itself, I think, can be a political act, that um, the effort that it takes to kind of shut out the noise of the contemporary moment and sit with questions and activities that can be kind of difficult and um, challenging in one's creative practice, um, I think that that can be a political act and a necessary one. It's a, it's a complicated issue, and I too, um, like you, try to look for um, more marginalized voices and um, women from past centuries and, you know, who was writing in, um, in Cuba in the 19th century and, and who was writing in the Baroque era, uh, women who we might not otherwise hear because we have the canon that we all have grown up with, um, you and me both and everybody in this room, and it's all, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, Haydn, and you get to the second and third rate and fourth rate composers and they're all, they're all white men. So um, it does take digging and doing some work, but it's such valuable work. And then you get someone in the audience saying, this person is amazing, I want to find out more about her. We both do collaboration, and I want to talk about the collaborative process and solitary work and what that means to you. Having a studio practice, I make mostly sculpture and installation and drawings. Um, I find myself being really refreshed by the opportunity to collaborate with other visual artists and also um, dancers and performance artists who um, I have a practice um, with a few different people of creating objects that then get moved with, um, dragged around, stood on, etc. And um, part of what's refreshing about that to me is that it makes it impossible to take yourself too seriously or for the work to be too precious. Um, and I love being reminded of the utilitarian potential of sculpture. Um, so I, I'm going to leave that there and I'm going <laughs> to ask you to answer the same thing. Working with others really keeps you honest, at least for a musician, you know, when you get into bad habits or you get a little lazy with rhythm or something and then you're with, with other musicians and it really, um, you, you tighten up and you sort of, uh, you have to be really precise. But there's nothing like solitary work, don't you think? I mean, there's nothing like the solitude of being in your studio and just, um, um, yeah, be, having a sort of transcendental, solitary, moment, yes. Yeah, we're sort of like the democratic debates here. We've got like 30 seconds <laughs> to say something important. <laughs> yeah, I think we, yeah. we did it, right? Thank we you so it. much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you everybody.